Hello? Thanks, Elena. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Tony I'm from Intel. Uh, glad, to see you. Uh, glad to see you here, and uh, thanks for coming to my talks today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the uh, exploitable Linux kernel vulnerabilities uh, 2017 to 2019. Here is the agenda. Uh, first of all, before the technical discussion, uh, I will show you some background information about the uh, Linux kernel vulnerability. Uh, then I will introduce the basic kernel exploitation uh, techniques. Uh, next are case studies. Uh, I choose two exploit cases which I think are interesting. One is about the uh, eBPF verifier bypass, and another is TimeRFD uh, risk contention. And uh, the last part is conclusion. Uh, I think everyone sitting here uh, today are already uh, familiar with the uh, Linux kernel and its main distribution families. Uh, but for the newcomer to the uh, Linux, one of the most uh, confusing thing is how many uh, distributions or the versions uh, there are. Maybe uh, Woodmont 2 or Red Hat Enterprise Linux or the Android are the ones most people are familiar with. Uh, but uh, there are hundreds of others as well. As we all know, these distributions have more or less modified the Linux kernel uh, to meet their customization needs. So how can we ensure the security of the so many distributions. Uh, seems there are no universal solutions, but and the uh, but at least we should do is to timely pull uh, pulling the patches from the mainline kernel and enable more widely uh, deployed security uh, mitigations. Uh, that sounds simple, but it's not the actual. Uh, then I wish to quickly uh, review the Linux kernel vulnerabilities trends from 2017 to 2019. Uh, from the number of the CVEs, uh, 2017 is a very special year. Uh, this year's CVE number is twice the second most uh, wrecked years. And from the below 20 years CVE trend chart, uh, we can see that the total number of CVEs are slow increasing before uh, 2017 and Zoom in 2017. And after that, the number of CVEs returned to, uh, to be normal and, uh, stands to, and uh, tends to be stable. I also, sorry. Uh, I also summarized the CWE of the Linux kernel vulnerability in the past three years. Uh, CW is common weakness enumeration. Uh, CW is more like categories why this vulnerability comes from, and each CVE belongs to a CW. Uh, here I list the top six CW. Basically, these CW types are also the common types of exploitable vulnerabilities. For example, the CW416 uh, is alpha free. Uh, which are known well, has, which has a high probability of exploitation for privilege escalation. And in this page, I list some uh, representative kernel vulnerabilities according to the timeline. Uh, there are about one or two uh, representative kernel vulnerabilities each year, which can be used to get universal root. Uh, of course, it's only based on my personal uh, opinion, and uh, it does not include the vulnerabilities we are going to talk about today. Uh, also, uh, also, ha we have been talking about CVEs in our previous uh, slides uh, content. Uh, what we need to emphasize uh, here is that the Linux security fix are not equal to CVEs. Actually, only a small part of kernel fix got CVEs. Uh, just like Greg said, uh, who is a, a stable Linux kernel maintainer as a Linux Foundation fellow. 
Uh, he said, if you are not using a stable or long-term kernel, you have an insecure, uh, insecure system. Uh, finally, at the end of the overview part, uh, I will give some notes about the following technical discussion. Uh, the talk is mainly focused on the overall Linux kernel exploitation techniques. Uh, the selected cases are based on the x86 and the ARM architecture uh, with Ubuntu or Android as target platform. And of course, all the vulnerabilities mentioned next have already been uh, public, mitig uh, mitigated, and uh, fixed. So the next part, uh, kernel exploitation for privilege escalation. Uh, first, uh, let's take a look at the definition of the privilege escalation, uh, described in a simple sentence. That is, a user received privilege they are not entitled to. Of course, they are motivated to uh, achieve the privilege escalation in Linux. Uh, for example, exploiting root services and weak system configuration and even the path uh, variables. Uh, besides this, the attacker can also exploit SUID executables or the pseudo writes. Uh, at least 3E2019, uh, 14287 here, because it's just a newly disclosed uh, disclosed sudo security policy bypass vulnerability a few days ago. Uh, finally, uh, what I want to introduce is exploiting kernel vulnerabilities. It's our main topic today. Uh, to easily under, uh, understand the following case studies, uh, let's have a look at the common root flow on Linux. Uh, the whole flow consists of two stages. Uh, the purpose of stage one is to get arbitrary kernel memory write, and the stage two is to get privilege escalation. Uh, of course, there are some steps uh, to bypass uh, the related uh, mitigations uh, in the process uh, for vulnerability exploit. Uh, there are often different techniques uh, for different vulnerability type. Uh, and for the other part, like control uh, execution flow and get arbitrary memory write and gain root uh, uh, privilege, there are also some general uh, tips. I will detail them in next, uh, uh, next slide. Uh, first, the control execution flow. Uh, this usually can be done by uh, modifying the victim function pointer or the stack register. Of course, there are some uh, criteria to choose the right function pointer. Uh, the first thing to certify is the reachable. And if it's even triggered from the user space, uh, it loses the meaning of talking about the latter condition. And the second condition is uh, that the shorter call paths with, the, with few uh, checks, uh, the better. And it, this will reduce the difficulty of constructing the special data to bypass the check and eventually tri uh, trigger the control pointer. And the last one, uh, can't affect the data structure used in our escalation process. Uh, of course, the choice of the common target function pointer is usually based on the vulnerability type. Uh, for example, if you are dealing with an uh, out-of-bound uh, write vulnerability, like uh, array index out of bounds, uh, we really have the option to directly modify the pointer in struct uh, file operations. And for the stack overflow, the return register is a common victim target. And for the heap overflow, we choose to modify the pointer in adjacent victim uh, heap object. And the last, use alpha free, uh, we usually over, override the victim pointer by means of heap spray. And what we need to think here is whether the control flow hijack uh, primitive is enough for the kernel uh, privilege escalation. Uh, in a few cases, like old kernel with fewer mitigations, uh, the answer uh, may be yes. But for most cases, uh, the arbitrary kernel memory reads or write is much better uh, because we can utilize this to bypass many defenses. 
Uh, then let's talking about get arbitrary memory right. Uh, usually there are two ways here. Uh, the first one is exploit vulnerability directly. Uh, but as vendors, communica uh, communications, and the developers pay more and more attention uh, to security in recent years, this type of vulnerability has become less and less. Of course, according to the quality of the vulnerability, the memory write can be divided into the arbitrary memory write and the restricted memory write. And the difference between them is whether the memory location and the return content are arbitrary and controllable. And another way is to modify address limit. Uh, first, let's look at what is address limit. Uh, to be simply, uh, address limit can be seen as the, pattern, uh, the partition between the user and the kernel space. It's a global variable and a member of the kernel's uh, structure, thread info. Uh, Windows here, starting with some version of the kernel, uh, some thread info uh, fields like address limit has been moved to the uh, thread strut. Uh, but this doesn't affect uh, our follow-up analysis. Uh, the uh, the usual pattern for setting address limit in the kernel is as follows. Uh, we set FS to kernel DS. The process can gain access to the entire uh, process, <coughs> the entire address space. And after completing the required operations, uh, the process will be restored to its original normal accessibility. Uh, but if the kernel could be made to ops or be hijacked, uh, the code uh, flow between the two set FS calls. The second call restores the address limit will never be made. Uh, that left the kernel data open to be overwritten by, the, uh, by user space. And let's look at the two code uh, snips from uh, the real kernel. Uh, we can see that for the both two functions, between the two set FS, there is a pointer which can be controlled uh, through the first parameter of the function. Uh, uh, if we can make the code flow to one of, the, uh, one of these two functions, uh, and at the same time, we can control the first uh, uh, parameter, then we can jump out of the function and uh, skip the uh, address limit uh, recovery uh, in Z code is the set FS to LDS. And uh, after that, we can uh, get the arbitrary memory write. Uh, so the last part, uh, gain root privilege. The most common and uh, classic method is to call the following two functions. It has been used by many real world attacks. Uh, in addition to use function calls to modify process credential, uh, we can also modify it directly. Uh, if, if we want, uh, want to uh, modify it directly, uh, we need to first locate the position uh, of the process related task structure first, and then find the location of the create structure uh, based on its offset. Uh, one thing we need to make, uh, we need to um, pay more attention here is the offset uh, may be different uh, for different kernel version. Uh, after uh, uh, after that, uh, the last step is to modify the process UID and GID, and through the arbitrary memory writing. Uh, next are case studies. Uh, the first case is uh, EPPF verifier uh, bypass vulnerability. Uh, before the detailed vulnerability analysis, let's first look at what is EPPF. Uh, EPPF was originally used for network packet uh, filter, and, and it can be used to run user space uh, code inside a sanity, a sanity checking virtual machine. And we all know there are security risks with allowing user space code to run, in, to run inside the kernel. Uh, so before the EPP, EPPF program loaded, a serious will check uh, will be performed. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, test ensures that the EPPF program terminates and don't 
and does not contain any loops. And the second stage is more involved and requires the verifier to simulate the execution of the EPBF uh, program uh, when instruction and the time. And the virtual machine stage is checked before and after uh, the execution of every uh, instruction to ensure the re register and the stack state are, inval are valid. Uh, this is the timeline about the vulnerabilities. Uh, Bruce found this vulnerability and uh, developed a working exploit, uh, but he doesn't public it. Uh, just uh, post uh, some information on on, tw on Twitter. Uh, you can see from the the, the left or right. And uh, in early December 2017, uh, Jen Horn uh, from Purgesero found it and uh, reported to the upstream. Yeah, uh, I think maybe Jen Horn is sitting uh, somewhere now. Yeah, because I see his, his topic for the risk condition exploitation is next to my topic. Uh, after that, Bruce public the exploit code and in addition, in the uh, March 2018, uh, another research recently also publicly released a different version of exploit code. And his Twitter reveals that the Ubuntu is still affected. In order to solve this, the mainline patch is also backported to the 4.4 stable kernel. Uh, this session will discuss the root cause of these vulnerabilities. A simple, disc a simple Description for the root cause is the uh, inconsistency between the simulation execution in verifier and the actual uh, code running uh, in the kernel. Uh, from the patch commit information, we can see that the check ALUOP function does not make a, a specific distinction between some certain operations. The attacker can utilize this to achieve malicious sure code execution. And the following is a text scenario for verifier bypass, which I got from Blue's the exploit code. Uh, let's observe the code, which is responsible for uh, processing the first instruction. Uh, first, the check ALUOP function will be invoked to check the validity of the related instruction. And here we can see that the immediate one load is retrieved from the instruction and is stored into the rack stage. And note that here the IMM in rack stage and in the BPF instruction are both signed in Tigger one law. Uh, then we come to the second uh, instruction. For this uh, instruction, uh, do check has to decide which branch to, uh, to take. We can find that the right code snippet is responsible for the deciding which branch to take. At this point, it's still comparing to signed integer. Based on the source one log given in the EPPF program, uh, the fourth rule uh, instruction uh, will be taken, and the other branch of the push, uh, push uh, stack uh, operations uh, will be ignored. And the instruction three is very clear. It's, uh, it's to assign a one log uh, to the return register. Let's look at the instruction for. Uh, since the previously push stack operation has not uh, been executed, so when you want to pop stack uh, to see if there are any instructions that need to continue checking, uh, the pop stack will return negative one directly. Then the do check will execute bricks to jump out to the entire check process. And the result is if there are some other instructions be, uh, behind these four instructions, uh, they will not be verified. And the next, let's look at the actual code running. Uh, we notice that the regs here is different from the regs given in the do check. It's an unsigned 64 bit one law. In the first instruction, the int one law, uh, IMM, which is HF. Uh, we will do sign extension to an unsigned 64 bit one law, uh, which means that the new one law stored in DST is 16F. So when we compare these two one law, the result here is uh, 
essentially the offsets the results from the verifier process. Uh, these two values are not equal. In this case, the, uh, the jump branch will be ticked and the malicious BPF instruction will be executed. Uh, this page is a brief summary uh, of the previous code analysis. Uh, that is when verifying the program will go to exit, uh, but when actually, the, actually code running, the program will go to the back code. And from here, we can uh, more clearly understand the root cause of the vulnerability. And for the privilege escalation, through the previous uh, introduction, we can already execute arbitrary uh, EBP, eBPF program. The next thing is to construct the specific EPB, EPBF uh, instruction to achieve arbitrary memory read or write. After that, we can modify the process the create. Uh, structure to get root privilege. Uh, due to the time limit, if you want to learn more details about this part, you can refer the below public exploit code. And we didn't introduce the mit mitigation bypass uh, for this exploit. Uh, in fact, all these common mitiga mitigations are invalid uh, for it, especially uh, the whole exploit doesn't need to know the address or a particular symbol, or we, need to, we don't need a gadget, so we don't need to, to know the symbol of the, some address. And also, we don't uh, execute user space code or access user space data uh, with, uh, with the supervisor mode. So there is no need to consider the KSR, SMEP, and uh, SMEP. For the KCFI, although it's not broadly adopted by the major uh, Linux kernel version, it was designed to uh, defend the control flow related attack. However, for this exploit, it doesn't uh, tamper with the control flow and it's just to utilize the, the native functionality to change the uh, program's uh, normal behavior. Uh, so it's also invalid. Uh, a simple case summary. And this should be considered a data-oriented attack with the ability to cause great damages, especially the type of attack. This type of attack can be used to modify the tables and uh, uh, change the memory perm uh, permission of the kernel code to be writable, and then inject the malicious code to the kernel space. And for example, we can patch the implementation of the control flow check to bypass the KF, KCFI. The good news is that many Linux distributions are uh, affected because they don't enable the eBPF feature and or they don't allow the uh, normal user access. Uh, next, the uh, timer FD risk condition. Uh, uh, I found uh, uh, and reported this issue to the Google Android security team in the early uh, 2017. Uh, I like to call it uh, time bomb vulnerability because it's related to the uh, timer and it can be used to get universal root. It's based on the file descriptor and there are three main system calls, uh, timer FD create, timer FD set time, and timer FD get time associated with it. And uh, look at the vulnerability analysis. Uh, both timer FD set up cancel uh, function and the timer FD uh, remove, remove cancel function will, per will perform the least operations. The developers want to pro uh, protest the might cancel cleaning only by set the context uh, might cancel. It's a global uh, variable to true or false. Uh, to per, uh, to perpetuate the list of operations, uh, but this prote uh, protection method uh, does not work against uh, the risk conditions. Let's cl cl clarify this by specific attack uh, scenario. In the next page. Uh, first, let's look at the left uh, diagram. Uh, the thread A set uh, the mm, context might cancel. Uh, to force and then delete C list. Uh, in the normal case, 
uh, it's impossible for ready to delete C list again because it will not pass uh, the if judgment. Uh, however, if, uh, if before the judgment, if the CPU uh, switch is context uh, to run thread B and the thread B modify uh, modify the context might cancel to true and then CPU uh, context switch to uh, switch again. At this time, thread A will pass uh, if judgment and uh, delete the C list node again, uh, cause the list corruption problem. And uh, in this case, the system will also crash. Uh, there is another situation. The same, li uh, the same list node uh, is, end is ended twice. In this case, we will no longer delete the, no the, the node when doing the list uh, delete operations, uh, causing the dangling um, pointer a problem. And uh, uh, in this case, the, uh, the dangling pointer problem can be converted to the user alpha free, and it's, it's possible to get privilege escalation by exploiting this. Uh, the following is the list operation details to explain uh, why it would cause dangling pointer issue. Uh, so uh, look at if we add the same code twice and then delete it, what will happen uh, after the execution of the related uh, link list operation? We found the node is still in the list after, uh, after the delete operation. Uh, that means if we already end the same node twice, uh, we, we, can't, uh, uh, we can't never delete it. And quickly go through the conventional UAF exploit chain. Uh, the first three step is to cause uh, is to use risk uh, risk condition to cause the user for free uh, problem. And after that, we did the heap spring. As the last two step are trigger and get the code execution. But we are in trouble. Uh, but we are in trouble uh, triggering the victim pointer. Uh, there is a capable check in our trigger path. Uh, the ordinary process doesn't have the uh, cap this time capability, and so we can't access to the victim uh, pointer. But as we all know, for Ubuntu, no privilege is required to create a username space. Uh, so can we use this to bypass the permission check? The answer is also no. Uh, let's look at the information I took from the map page of the username space. Uh, it clearly uh, describes uh, some privileged operations like camp system, uh, camp system module, camp make node are not associated, uh, associated with any name and space type. Only the initial username space can perform such operations. Uh, before intro uh, introduce the final solution, I will first introduce two concepts. Uh, one is TOC TOU and another is pipe subsystem. Uh, TOC TOU means time will check to time will use. Uh, the, the following simple uh, example could give us a good understanding of that. After the access check, we link the field to the victim field. For example, the, the, the computer uh, password, and then we can override the password. It, it's just a, sim uh, 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 a simple uh, example. And then look at the pipe subsystem. Here I will introduce a system call related to the pipe system, a read with this call. It uses a series of IO vectors to describe user buffer. Uh, if the number of the IO vector is greater than eight, uh, it will chemalloc the memory on the heap. Otherwise, it will put the IO vector on the stack. Uh, and when no, uh, when no contents available from the right, uh, right end read way may block in the kernel, uh, then uh, uh, we can, we, these IO vectors may stay in the kernel uh, heap. So uh, according to the above uh, distribution, Description, we can use read we for uh, heap spree. Uh, in this case, our uh, victim uh, buffer is greater than eight, so we can use this. 
TOC2 also exists in the pipe uh, system. We found the pipe will check the IO vector and make sure its IO base point, uh, points to the user's base. After that, when pipe perform copy to user, it, w it will not check the IO, IO base again. So if we can modify the IO vector at this internal, uh, to achieve this, we can, uh, uh, there are two types of vulnerabilities that can be used to modify the IO, IO vector uh, between, uh, uh, between the uh, internal of the time of check and the time of use. And uh, the vulnerability we are discussing uh, is actually a use after free uh, vulnerability. So we should be able to uh, use this to complete the full exploitation. Uh, the following is uh, detailed list uh, operations. We combine the list operation with pipe heap spray. Uh, I think this part is difficult to understand uh, unless uh, you, you do it uh, by yourself, step by step. Uh, so I will quickly go through and only explain some results. And if you are uh, interested in, in this part, uh, you can deep dive into uh, it offline. Uh, the first step, uh, we add victim uh, context twice and then delete and free it. Through the previous introduction, uh, we know that such operations uh, will not delete the victim node. Uh, there are decimal pointer in the heap buffer. So next we need to do is heap three. So we use uh, the readme to heap three to modify the list node. Uh, then we block readme and modify our base by delete another node, contact A, and the last step, uh, we pipe write our prepared container to modify contact B. Uh, the next and uh, contact B next and previous pointer. And uh, finally, we delete contact B to achieve restrict memory write. Uh, for the kernel address space layout randomization, uh, an attacker does not even need an arbitrary uh, uh, read primer primitive to bypass it. Uh, with an info leak from the message, it can be easily bypassed, especially for one two. Uh, and there are no restrictions on access to the message. And we can just trigger some warning uh, information or force uh, a, pick, a pitch fault uh, because the panic on ops is not enabled in Ubuntu. And uh, for the Android, SE Linux will restrict access to the D message, but there are some still a uh, small number of vendors or products that can allow access to the D message shown as the blue picture. Uh, of course, in addition to this, uh, we can also use the hardware uh, side channel, the uh, timing attacking method, uh, to bypass the KSL. And next, the SMEP uh, bypassing. Uh, the first method is bit flipping by reuse the native write CR4. The scheduled set affinity syscall is to force the exploit program to be executed on one CPU call and thus make sure that the user space payload will be executed on the same call where we uh, have disabled the SMEP. I need to mention here, the schedule uh, set affinity uh, syscall can also be used to help uh, improve the, sex, the success rate of the heap spring. And so another method is address limit uh, exploiting. Uh, we have introdu uh, introduced this uh, previous. And one situation to discuss here is what to do if the first parameter uh, the first parameter is the uh, RDI in the x86, uh, x84, and uh, uh, x0 register in the ARM64 uh, architecture. Uh, if it can't be controlled, what, what we can do? Uh, instead, we can control a pointer uh, in the file structure, uh, then construct uh, in the 
uh, like the LF sync and the check flags uh, in the field uh, operations and then construct the parameters we need uh, in the user mode. Of course, SMAP will block this method. But if there are only SMEP uh, enabled, this uh, this valid. About several years ago, uh, Red to DIR also have been proposed to bypass M SMEP and SMAP. Uh, however, with the kernel patch applied, uh, this uh, fits, uh, fits map page are no longer executable. So currently, it's not valid except for some older kernel version. Uh, so the case summary, mm. in this case, attackers can't trigger the victim function pointer uh, due to the capability check. Uh, as a result, we can't use traditional user for free uh, exportation, exportation techniques. Uh, but uh, by combining uh, the list operations with, uh, with the pipe heap spree, we also achieve memory write, also we write the write content is uh, restricted. After that, we have two options. Uh, one is modify the address limit to get the arbitrary uh, memory read and write. And another one is to directly read the driver associated function uh, to specific uh, GOP chain uh, to achieve the arbitrary memory read I like. Uh, it's like we can modify the our control of the uh, specific driver, like the PTMX, DV PTMX, and uh, uh, make uh, is some command of uh, the uh, our control point to some specific GOP chain to directly get arbitrary memory write. And uh, the last conclusion, the last part, uh, the first one uh, is important to know your enemy. As we all know, defense is more difficult because it requires a continuation of various attack and uh, its attack means and the attack surface. So we can't separate the defense from the attack. We need to keep abreast of the exploit techniques to promote defense better. And the second, security is not just uh, is not just a, a simple integration. Uh, of the various uh, mitigations, just uh, like uh, even you have already enabled the uh, kernel address space layout randomization, uh, but it can be easily bypassed only through the demessage info leak. As, uh, as, as this, a small uh, leak will sink a great ship. And the last one, uh, now the widely deployed mitigations are against uh, the control flow attack so the, this attack we are talking about are mostly based on the control flow attack, but we also need to pay more attention to the data-oriented attack. Uh, even some uh, I, I, have, I have noticed that there are some papers uh, propose some mitigations to uh, prevent uh, the data-oriented attack, but it can be predicted that uh, there will be many related um, uh, variants uh, in the future. Uh, this is a reference. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Uh, any, any questions? Questions? This is a big room, so I'll have to be fit running. Hey, great talk. Um, have you looked at the exploitability of L1TF or all the other Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities that came out in the last two years? Because they are exploitable in the lab environments, but I yet to see someone publicly claim that they can do that in real native environment. Uh, do you mean the special and Meltdown? Yeah, yeah, Spectrum, Meltdown, L1TF, have you, yeah. have you looked how exploitable they are in the real environment where, you know, the cache is flying all, everywhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I know what, uh, what you mean. Uh, it's uh, the Spectrum and the Meltdown are the CPU-based uh, vulnerabilities. It's different uh, what we are talking today. It's the 
the, it's from the kernel OS version. Uh, we are talking about today. Uh, I, I know there are some uh, techniques uh, used to like uh, just use it to some catch flash and uh, some other to exploit it, but I, I don't know much details about this. Uh, sorry. sorry for that. Any other questions? Thanks for the talk. You mentioned uh, this SMEP um, bypass with native write CF4 yeah. register uh, uh, function. And um, recently there was some additional mitigation for CR4 pinning. Did you have a look at it? And uh, uh, are there any comments? Uh, yeah, I, I know there are some mitigations, new mitigations uh, that uh, ad adopt to mitigate uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, this kind of attack, like uh, we can't use uh, use this. Uh, so uh, I introduced the net the, the net uh, method. Uh, we can uh, we can control our code flow to the uh, code flow to the uh, to to this kind of address. And if we uh, if we also uh, in addition to control the code flow. If we also can control one register, like uh, the RDI and the X0, uh, we can prepare its, uh, its content in the username space and to uh, use this method to uh, get uh, the arbitrary memory right. Yeah. So the first method is n not needed if you use the second one, right? Yeah. Oh, thank you. More questions? So if no one else has a question, I have a question. So you mentioned at the end that we should be paying more attention to these data-oriented attacks. So is there any technique or a like group of technique that you feel is the most prominent? I mean, from defense point of view, against this data-oriented attack, that we as kernel security people should be start paying more attention and looking into? <laughs> Uh, actually, so I'm sure there are many pr proposed in the research, and, and have you do you have your own like things you maybe preferences which you think that some defenses are more kind of better shot to do and to look into the kernel space? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, uh, this is a difficult question. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess. Uh, so. And uh, the the. Yeah, just as uh, the as the first, I say the defense is. Uh, I think the defense is uh, difficult uh, than the attack. Yeah, it's required to know the every attack surface, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to know every the attack uh, means. Uh, so, um, uh, I so for the, uh, for the defense. Uh, developer, uh, I, I, I maybe I want so I, I maybe I want suggest that uh, except for uh, to be uh, focus on the uh, defense itself, it uh, it's be better to know something more about the exploitation techniques. I, I think this. So, I guess your suggestion is that we should yeah. be. Le educating ourselves more yeah. on these data oriented attacks and, and kind yeah. of thinking more towards how do we protect against them. Yeah. Okay. So, any more questions? Or? So, in that case, let's thank the speaker. Okay. Okay. Thank you.